Guys, welcome back to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. We have five guys as you get to know them and you know do some last minute prep for the season, but it's an exciting time. Do yeah. right, you know how this game how it goes? I have never played this game, so okay. throw it at me. So we'll flash a card and then we'll Yeah, there's probably a lot of guys that do that. <laughs> uh, next All right, guys, welcome back to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. We have the one and only Eric Cressy in the house. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm good, guys. How are you? Doing well, man. And you know what I forgot to say? That's the best name in the world because <laughs> I- I'm Eric and this is Chris. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's not fair. Right. I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, yeah. And you said that you're over in Tampa right now because it's you're during the Yankees uh, spring training, right? Yeah, for sure. So um, it's, the, it's a crazy time of year where, you know, you, you basically get to speed date 75 guys as you get to know them and, you know, do some last minute prep for the season. But it's an exciting time. You get to right on. Start, yeah. start a new. Yeah, and we'll definitely dig into that a little bit later in the show. So uh, let's let's kick this off, Eric. So once again, uh, you know, thanks for you know uh, spending time with us, and I really just value time. And I know you're a busy man, so um, let's get into it. So we like to start off our show a little bit different. So we like to give the guests a couple options here. So we could either go with rapid dynamic questions, or we could go with a, a game called Never Have I Ever and just draw <laughs> like six random cards and questions. Have fun with. What do you think? Let's let's do the cards. I'm feeling feeling wild tonight. <laughs> What the okay, heck? cool. Do you, do you know how this game how it goes? I have never played this game, so okay. throw it at me. So we'll flash a card and then we'll we'll uh, read it off. And all you have to say is either I have or I never have. All right. Okay. All right. Let's go. <laughs> so never have I ever stolen a tip off a table at a restaurant. Never. Okay. All right. <laughs> never. Okay. Card number two. Never have I ever taken naked selfies. He picked that one out. <laughs> ne- never. Never. <laughs> No, I, right. I, I have no game. I would never have even the, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a game to the nth degree that is uh, totally inappropriate in, in this world right now. So definitely yeah. never. <laughs> For sure. All right. Next one. Never have I ever been caught driving without a license. Never. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm lame guys. I'm boring. Hey, it's, it's, it's fine. It's all good. This is just having some fun. All right. Next one. Never have I ever hired a personal trainer because they were hot. <laughs> Never. Uh, I, I probably entered the fitness industry probably too soon myself, I guess. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a lot too, of too busy working myself. Yeah, there's probably a lot of guys that do that. <laughs> uh, next one. Never have I ever fallen off a boat. <laughs> uh, I definitely have fallen off boats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up in Southern Maine, so there's a lot of, a lot of boat time growing up. It had to have happened at least yeah, you know, right a, on. a few dozen times. <laughs> All right, Eric, last card here. So never have I ever sniffed glue. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, probably in elementary school. So I'll have to, I'll have to own that one. Yeah, I guess I have. <laughs> cool. Right on, man. So yeah, you're off the hot seat with that game. and uh, wasn't uh, so bad. You're, you're brave. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. There's some really bad yeah. cards. So I mean, luckily we didn't draw the worst ones. <laughs> I, dodged, I dodged a bullet there. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, Eric. So let's let's just uh, d- uh, dive right into this. So um, obviously, you know, we're still going through a, a pandemic, right? And when it first happened, I mean, it really struck the fitness industry in you know really crazy ways. And I know you've had a really awesome you know place that you've developed, Eric Cressy Sports, uh, um, uh, your sports performance place. So how did that? How did COVID affect it? And did you have to do anything to pivot? During yeah, that time. Yeah, that was, I mean, pivot was kind of the theme of the year in 2020 yeah. and it continues in 2021. So actually uh, it's kind of a, a tale of, of two cities. Um, so we have a facility just west of Boston. That was our, our first location that opened 2007. And in 2014, we actually opened our second location um, in Jupiter and it's now Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Um, and what was interesting is obviously seeing two different states that had entirely different rules and regulations, how they approach this. You know, obviously Florida was what's much more open, Massachusetts was one of the hot spots early on. So, you know, I think there was, there was definitely a lot more, you know, fear mm-hmm. around this early on in mass. And um, so it was very interesting because we actually opened a brand new kind of world-class, you know, dream facility in Palm Beach Gardens where we have baseball fields and turf fields and cages and mounds and a brand new 10,000 square foot facility. And we actually opened it, um, I think it was December 27th of, of 2019. So it mm-hmm. was, it was interesting because we had a, uh, you know, what was a you know business of five years, but it was something where we added several different entities, whether it was hitting or pitching or the ability to do more stuff outside, you know, we brought in two physical therapists. It just, it expanded, you know, exponentially. And 
And it also coincided when, uh, with, you know, Florida kind of being a destination. I think I heard the other day that a thousand new people move to the state of Florida every yeah. day. Yeah. So it's kind of like everybody's leaving California and going to Texas and Arizona. Exactly. Everybody's leaving the Northeast, um, and, and coming to, to Florida. So, um, our business actually grew a lot in Florida. Um, you know, once we got past that initial stage where you know, people were freaked out, we, you know, we realized we could do this safely. And, and I think a lot of ways, you know, Florida led from the front with respect to how they handled, you know, gyms in, in this era. Massachusetts was actually a, a markedly different story. It was closed up much, much longer. You know, we were closed for a couple of weeks in Florida and in Massachusetts, it was, you know, over three months. Um, so certainly the, you know, the growth that we'd been experiencing historically there it was attenuated. Um, we had to kind of adapt and you know, we were training guys outside and, you know, doing small group size. I and mean, we have a 15,000 square foot facility with, with 40 foot wow. tall ceiling. So it's, it's about as safe as you can get from a social distancing standpoint, yeah. but you know, we were, we were lumped in with the planet fitnesses and gold's gyms and those like, you know, that, that have much higher head counts and tighter quarters and things like that. So it, it was, um, it was challenging, but, um, you know, there, there were a lot of things that changed for sure. in the way that we ran those businesses, I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting is I did more personal training this year than I've probably done in any of the past 10 mm. years. You know, it, it, it was, it was a combination of, you know, people who were, you know, kind of interested for paying for, for one-on-one -on -one because it did kind of guarantee smaller group sizes. Um, but it was also a function of in, in this era of, of COVID um, in major league baseball, there was a shortened season. There was a really quick ramp up. Um, I think I read some number. Baseball injuries were up 178 percent over the previous year. This year, so I remember that a lot of yeah, a lot of those one on one sessions were were high profile guys who were going through rehabilitation scenarios. Um, so I mean, we pivoted in a million different ways. Everything from cleaning procedures to more rigid scheduling. And I think they're actually, you know, for being honest, a lot of the things that we learned this year are going to make our business systems better longer term. So I think. You know, last I had heard, it was over 30% of gyms nationwide had gone out of business yeah. in, in 2020. And, you know, gyms, gyms have a high failure rate anyway. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think you, it, to some degree, it, it probably separated out some of the people who, who really were able to establish good systems. And they'll, they'll probably, you know, be the gyms that probably sustain even better moving forward. But yeah, like everybody else, we were writing programs of, you know, people were front squatting their girlfriends and yeah. you know, tur Turkish gallops and backpacks and <laughs> external rotations with soup cans, whatever we could do to keep guys moving. was Yeah. No, and I'm happy to hear that you guys pivoted and did, and did yeah. everything just right. And I mean, just, um, yeah, it's just a testament, man, that you guys were ready to, to do that and stuff. And I guess yeah. my next thing was like, did you have like any personal, just like breakthroughs or just any sil silver linings just personally, just through this whole pandemic? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's actually really funny. I, <laughs> this is going to be for the exact opposite reason um, than you might think, you know, a lot of people have these, you know, aha moments, right? Hey, I, I, I stayed home and I learned how to speak Russian or something like that. <laughs> uh, I distinctly remember it. Uh, so Sam Fold it was, is one of our retired athletes. He's now the general manager of the Philadelphia Phillies and, and Sam and I are real close. You know, our kids went to the same school when he lived down here in Florida before he took the Phillies job. And so we talked pretty regularly and you know, we had a conversation. I want to say it was like early to mid-May. And um, it was before he was actually named general manager of the Phillies. He was in a different role with the organization. And he dropped a line on me. And it, it was it was actually exactly what I needed to hear in the moment. He's like, you know, I, I never felt like I've been so busy, but less productive. And I'm like, same here. Like it was, it was, you know, one of those things where I came to realize how, how much I value deep work. Mm -hmm. and, and you realize a lot of that deep work comes because you know, your kids can go play with their friends or they go to school or they do, you know, something different. And all of a sudden you're, you're having to be like homeschool teacher. You're, you know, you're having to, you know, try to keep a business afloat while you're, you're dealing with, you know, extra levels of uncertainty. Everybody's kind of on edge, you know, what's going on in the world. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're trying to figure out what the next six months are going to look like. You know, in my case, we were trying to figure out what major league baseball was going to look like. So, you know, I, I think I just realized in that moment that the, the busy and productive are not the same thing. Um, and that it was, it was a, you know, for me to continue doing what I want to do and, you know, being a productive you know member of society, like I, I do need to be really rigid with how I schedule myself and, yeah. you know, to some degree how I guard my time. And, and that doesn't mean don't spend time with your family. It means, compartmentalize. Um, and Sam's one of the brightest guys in the world. He's got a Stanford degree, super smart. And um, so to hear him say that was actually really helpful for me. So, you know, we, we were joking, misery deserves company and, and he's doing great now as well. But, um, you know, just one of those things where, you know, COVID I think taught a lot of people like, yeah. you know, working from home is not that easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of cons to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I think, the, you know, when I heard, you know, the world's shutting down, I'm like, oh, I'm going to write a book. 
you know, just because I, when I was in my mid twenties, I, you know, I was the guy that could, you know, basically just go into a, you know, like a hole for a week and write a book and, and be that productive. It's a lot harder to do that than it, than it was back then with, with life's demands. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great uh, learning lesson too. Busy is not the same as being productive. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so Eric, I mean, man, where do we start with just kind of like your accomplishments and everything you've done in the fitness industry? I mean, you've been in the fitness industry well over a decade, right? Yeah, it's, I, I believe it or not, it's actually like two decades. I'm, I'm wow. 39. I'm 39 and my first job in a gym was at age 19. So yeah, yeah. That's insane, I man. remember watching all your YouTube videos yeah. and I was like, in my in your blog, so I was like, man, like, I mean, yeah. I had a lot more hair in those as you can <laughs> It's all good, man. You look great. So my question is just like, I mean, two decades in the fitness industry and everything you've accomplished. I mean, what are you most proud of like these past 20 years, I would say? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a lot of things. You know, this this might surprise you. So I mean, I think there's, you know, certainly you celebrate the successes of your athletes, you know, because at the end of the day, being a good coach is about, about serving others. So you want... Um, you know, people to make it to the big leagues and, you know, you're, you're certainly flattered that they trust you with your career and you, and you, you take that responsibility incredibly seriously. You know, I'm, 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 I'm equally excited about like, you know, the, you know, the kid who didn't have confidence as a teenager and he might not have become a big leaguer, but I can't tell you how many guys that we have who are, who are now entrepreneurs on their own. And they talk to us about how the lessons they learned training with us in high school are, are things that have sustained them. And a lot of them actually stay in touch. It's, it's pretty cool. I actually follow a bunch of our retired athletes on Twitter who are in the baseball world. And they're always like drawing back and forth now in a business context like they were back when they trained. But you know, the one that actually I'm, I'm, I'm probably particularly proud of is, is, is how our, um, our interns and our, our former coaches have gone on to do some really cool stuff. You know, I, I say, you know, we're, we're a training facility, obviously, first and foremost, but we're a teaching facility second. Um, you know, so we had, you know, Eric Roney was, was a, an intern at, at our Massachusetts facility. He won a world series with the Dodgers last mm -hmm. year. You know, Kevin Gilb was a former intern. He was with the Boston Bruins, you know, in, in the Stanley cup finals. Like we, we have people who are in the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, um, all over the place. We have, you know, guys that are working as, you know, personal trainers for, you know, high level PGA players. I'm yep. um, just doing some really cool stuff, but also people who are working in academia and teaching the next generation of coaches. So when I see the, the impact that I think we've had on teaching others, and when I hear an intern say, Hey, I, I learned more in four months with you guys than I did in my four year, you know, college degree. Like for me, that's the one that's most impactful because we know that that's, that's, that's a multiplier, right? That's something that's going to yeah. have an impact for, for tens of thousands more people if, if they teach someone and they teach someone. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of, of what we've accomplished with, with an internship program. Honestly, that kind of started by accident with an intern <laughs> that sh showed up and said, Hey, I want to be your intern. And we were like, all right. So here we are now. Yeah, absolutely. So then even too, I, I'm just really just, um, man, it's, it's, it's a, it's a lot of time you put into, you know, Cressy performance and just even before you had this vision to start, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there was just like a lot of just like self -limit limiting beliefs, like fear of failure, fear of getting started, just like this could go wrong. But like, what was like that, that pivoting moment where you just took action? You were just like, forget this. Like, I'm going to just do this no matter what, like, this is my, my vision and I have to bring this to life. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know that it was um, it was like that. It was interesting. When I, when I first moved back to Boston, um, you know, I, I built a clientele pretty quickly and kind of got my foothold in a in a baseball community, working as an independent contractor. And um, it, it kind of coincided with the time that my now business partner Pete was doing his MBA, and so I was I was just learning. You know, I was working thirteen hours a day, seven days a week. I was a one man show, so I was scheduling, I was billing. Um, I, I literally just started dating my wife. Our, our first date was in April of, of 2007. And, um, you know, I, we were obviously getting really serious. And I realized, like, if I wanted to take a day off to, you know, go to a baseball game with her or, you know, go to Maine or whatever it was, like, it, I lost revenue. And it, it wasn't a scalable model. I was exhausted all the time. And, you know, my business partner, Pete, at the time was, you know, saying, hey, we, you know, we should kind of, we should think about teaming up on this. You know, I can, I can handle the business side of things. You obviously can handle the training things. And, you know, I read the, the e-myth by Michael Gerber, where he talks mm -hmm. about the, te yeah. the technician, yeah. the entrepreneur, and the manager. And yep. I was a technician, but, and, and I was an entrepreneur, but I just didn't have time to do the managerial stuff. And, and being honest, uh, you know, at the time I didn't realize it, I, I wasn't a great manager. You know, I, I, you know, I wasn't ready to do that. I didn't have the bandwidth to do it. So, you know, the, the opportunity kind of just came up, um, you know, I was working on another facility there and, and things weren't going necessarily awesome for them logistically, financially. So the writing was kind of on the wall there. And, 
you know, one Friday afternoon, just decided it was time to do it. And we actually had a, a good relationship with one of our existing athletes whose dad had a baseball facility and he had some space to sublet. So we, you know, we outfitted a facility over the course of a few days, actually got a moving truck, drove down to the Perform Better Warehouse in, in Rhode Island and outfitted it. And we, we started training guys on, on Tuesday morning. And um, I, I started out with 47 clients that, you know, had been, you know, people that I built up over that year, a combination of personal training clients and, and also some semi-private ones, most of them, you know, local baseball kids. And, um, you know, just, we learned a lot, you know, Tony Gentilcourt, who's obviously a mutual friend, yeah. Tony, yeah. Tony came on as well and was one of our initial three with me and my business partner, Pete. And, you know, it just kind of grew exponentially. We did double digit growth every year. And in 2014, we became more of a national brand when we opened the second facility. And, um, you know, it spun itself off into a lot of different things, but you know, the thing I, I, I look back on is I don't, I don't know that I ever had, um, that, that, you know, imposter syndrome moment, like that fear of failure. Um, and, and I think to some degree it, it was, it was, it was naivety. Like I just, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't realize I invested my life savings and if I had thrown it in the market, it would have, it, this was 2008, 2009, really, I would have lost it all when the, when the market crashed. Instead, I invested into a business that appreciated, you know, dramatically. But I, I do look back and, and my dad ran his own business. Um, my brother was involved in the family business. Pete, my business partner's dad was self-employed. Growing up, I worked at a tennis club and I, I was entrepreneurial. I, I bought a racket string machine. Yeah. I learned how to string tennis rackets. So I'd always been exposed to entrepreneurship. And I had always kind of taken note that the glamour of autonomy, if you're not careful, can mask you know, the, the challenges of, of hard work, right? I knew my, my dad, uh, our, our family business was a school bus distributorship. So it's Thomas built buses underneath Daimler Chrysler and um, which is you know, basically alongside Freightliner. So my dad would buy buses from, you know, a, a factory in North Carolina, they would be delivered to Maine and he would sell them to school districts for, you know, a, a nominal profit. And, you know, the challenge there would be sometimes bids would fall through and our house would be collateral on it. So, you know, in hindsight, I didn't realize that, you know, we almost lost our house multiple times growing up, but, you know, dad would be up at the office writing bids to school district and, you know, three in the morning. And I, I didn't understand why I just knew dad worked hard. And I think Pete saw the same thing with his parents and, you know, it was actually a really good lesson. Our best employees over the years have actually been kids of people who were self-employed. Mm. Um, I've always had really good experiences just because I think they can walk a mile in their shoes. So I think I, I never dealt with that, like, you know, fear of failure or anything like that, because one, I was naive, but two, um, I, I kind of knew what entrepreneurship entailed. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure I did a good job in maybe describing that to my wife, even though she actually <laughs> grew up in a family, her parents were both self-employed and, and she worked, you know, with them at craft shows and things like that growing up. So probably makes her more understanding now, but um, I, I never would have imagined it would become what it is. And, I think the bigger challenge for me was understanding that running a profitable business is a lot different than managing a, a scalable brand. And that's been, you know, understanding how to manage growth is a lot harder than the startup phase. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 oh, go ahead. Yeah. And just real quick, what stood out to me, you said that you're, that you were naive, but it's, it's, it's almost like when you're an entrepreneur, it's just like, I just heard this from uh, one of my mentors. He said that you have to be delusional about your superpowers and how big you think. Yeah. And others might not understand that, but you understand that you see that. And, you know, no matter what, you understood that you knew what it had, you, you knew what you were trying to accomplish and where you were going. And no matter whoever thought that you were like out of your mind and naive, just you stuck with it, man. And that's, that's amazing. I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. You're probably like, dude, come on. I was literally watching this video, watching this interview, and you literally just pop up on the screen and interrupt it. Trust me, there's a good reason for this. Just hold on, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you get back to that interview or that video. Trust me, all right? So the reason why I stopped you on this is because we're giving away our book 100% free, okay? So if you're a frustrated fitness professional, you're not growing fast enough, you're looking to future-proof and recession-proof your business by adding online training, or if you're doing online training, you wanna scale and go and grow faster, all you have to do is check out our new book. We're giving the audio away, we're giving the PDF um, away. So all you have to do is click the link below in the description box and get your free copy, all right? So now, back to the video. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a balance you're trying to swing too. Like I, I've actually read, you know, basically in the past that, the most successful entrepreneurs actually tend to be very pessimistic about their business, but they tend to be very optimistic in the way they interact with others. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you can always, you, you have to be careful. Like you can always walk into your business and find something that's wrong. Right? Yeah, yeah. You can, you can find a bathroom that wasn't swept correctly or a door that was left unlocked last night or a plate that didn't get put back where it was, or, you know, a program that wasn't formatted correctly, but you know, you have to be cognizant of saying like, all right, 
this is just a you know a little issue and and whoever was responsible for this has done 15 other things perfectly well today and saved me bunches of headaches you know whereas you have to look at the the business from a, a pessimism standpoint in terms of like hey are we getting stagnant how are we improving you know is our quality of coaching getting better um you know are we, you know, basically delivering the highest quality product to our athletes? You know, are we communicating expectations to both our staff and our clients effectively? So, um, you know, I think you have to find a balance between being pessimistic the way you look at your business, but optimistic in the way you present yourself every day. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And then, so I want to talk now, Eric, about just like sacrifice. And I know you're no stranger to that. I remember like reading yeah. some of your articles that like you were like a bartender too, right? Yeah, I, I during grad school I, I bartended and I personal trained on the side while doing yeah. my grad assistantship. So it was, it was really kind of three jobs throughout grad school. Yeah, I remember reading that man. I was just like, that's so impressive, you know. But it's like, yeah. look where you're at now with like two locations and like you guys have established yourselves as like basically like the go to like high performance facility, you know. So my question, I guess, is you know like what have you got? What have you done? Just kind of like deliberately, just like strategically and intentionally to build this business up to like the go to type of like sports performance and working with these elite athletes because my hope for the listeners is that you got to sacrifice, you know, for some of these things that you want. And then it's like, these aren't going to happen overnight. You know, you're going to get knocked down, but it's like, you got to get back up every single day. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's multifaceted for sure. I think I'd say one thing that's, that's definitely helped me is I, I have good business partners um, in, in Massachusetts, you know, Pete, Pete always jokes that he's kind of the pump the grapes guy and I'm the accelerator guy. So we we're kind of like the yin and the yang where we cancel each other <laughs> out well. And, you know, I'll be the ideas guy and he'll, he'll talk a lot more about like, Hey, how do we execute that? Um, so we, we tend to be different in that regard, but I think it's, it's, it's certainly cordial. Um, but it's, it's also very helpful for making sure that we don't misstep. But at the same time, I, you know, I, I pull him along if he's, if he's getting too comfortable. So I, I think we're good in that regard. And, you know, similarly in Florida, like we, you know, we have a dynamic where different people didn't bring different things to the table and, you know, we're still sorting that relationship out. I'm actually, my wife works with us as well. So she's, she's amazing administratively and makes me look way smarter than I really am. So <laughs> you know, I think, I think being aligned with the right people is certainly a huge part of it. You know, I think the other thing is, is fiscal responsibility. I know that's, it's not sexy and it's not like this raw, raw, uh, like Braveheart speech from my, my, my horse as I walk in front of the troops. But, um, you know, like I, I didn't do stupid things with my money early on. I, I saved like a chipmunk. I didn't spend the money on a penny on, you know, an alcohol during college. Um, and it, it really, you know, and I didn't come from, you know, amazing means. I, like you commented, I, I worked three jobs during grad at school so that I didn't leave with a bunch of student debt. Um, and I was, I was very fortunate that, you know, every penny I made, I, I put into a situation where it made me very financially viable for the day when I was, you know, 25, when I decided I'm going to sink my life savings into a new gym. And uh, at the time, like if I had lost it all, it wasn't, it wasn't like I couldn't recoup it, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a big deal, but I just see so many people who open gyms because they, they like to work out and they think it's just going to magically fall into place. And, it doesn't work like that. You know I mean? There are days when it's no different than running a restaurant or running an accounting firm or, mm-hmm. or anything else. You, you can't spend more than you make. And, and that's, that, that sounds very logical when we have you know, this conversation on a podcast and in the day to day, a lot of people don't track their numbers and they get surprised, you know, yep. they, you know, like I, best example I can give you, like I, I actually do a lot of our accounting stuff. Like we had an employee that just cashed three checks from the past three months today. Like just, they've been sitting in his wallet, um, <laughs> you know, and he was a guy that had opted not to go on direct deposit, but it's like, if you don't understand how, you know, basically cash flow works, like you could overdraw your account and it was, yeah. it's not a big deal for us. It's, it's more on him, but it's just kind of one of those things where you have to prepare and, and we see so many people in the fitness industry that, that don't know their numbers. So um, we actually teach business mentorships. And one of the things I, I talk about is, you know, there's kind of four entities to running a business, right? There's lead generation, there's lead conversion, um, there's retention, and then there's systems. Yep. And, and when, when gym owners come to these courses, they almost always think that like it's lead generation, man, if I could just get more people in, in the door, you know, they, they, they very rarely know like how many of those leads are you even converting? We, we convert yeah. 99% of the people that reach out to us just because most of them are pre-sold based on conversations or reading my stuff or relationships or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, retention and systems are the ones that people don't think about enough. How many people are going out the back door and really your systems are what guide all of the other things. They, they all work closely together. So I always tell people, if you can establish systems that, you know, allow you to track, right? You know, measure what's working, what isn't, um, and just, you know, protect against downside, you have to do it. Right. And, and, and so we always try to write the ship with people as they come in, you know, from thinking that they just need 
need more members to understand that there's probably a lot more to it. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. We we see that all the time too. You know, like in like the coaches that we coach too. It's like they want just more leads and all that stuff, but the systems are broken. The business model is completely broken. There's no back end. You know what I mean? So I I can totally agree with that. Well, everyone's always trying to put the cart before the horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no doubt about it. And I think the other thing too that we see a lot in this this industry is it, it, we actually joke about it. So our you know, one of the things that we did with our new our first facility was our, our our colors are black and red right and so what we did in our first facility we had a bunch of white walls and we just did a red stripe probably i don't know four and a half five feet off the ground all around the facility um and then we would like take like t-shirts of like the the you know the high schools and colleges of kids that we train and we we'd basically put them up on the wall and like all of a sudden we look around the industry and we, we coined the term hashtag CP family. Um, we were at Cressy performance. We're now re- rebranded to Cressy sports performance. So it's CSP family, but we had that on the wall. And all of a sudden now we look around the gym, everybody's got red stripes. They got t-shirts, thumbtacks to the wall. And then their hashtag, whatever family it's like, guys, just be original, be yourself. Like we have so many copycats in this industry and that's you know, obviously it's a trivial thing, but if you go and you try to, you know, be Mark Fisher fitness and, you know, in Mississippi, it's not going to work, right? It works great if you're on Broadway. Um, you know, if you're Cressy Sports Performance, you want to train elite baseball players and you're going to go to like the middle of nowhere in, in North Dakota, it's probably not going to work. Yeah. So I just, I think there are too many people that are trying to follow other people's model instead of like embracing what's unique about themselves and figuring out how it fits in their, their desired market. Hundred percent, absolutely. So, where do you where do you feel like the, the fitness industry is going? Just kind of as a whole, just like after with all this happening in the pandemic and everything. Yeah, I mean, if you would ask me this a, a year ago, I, I would have told you that I, I do see it becoming much, much more specialized. I think we had seen a trend of that, particularly with respect to sports performance training. You know, baseball facilities like you really can't be a strength and conditioning facility for baseball unless you do skill development as well. Unless you have pitching, you have hitting you have the ability to give guys to do everything in one place. And that's been, been huge for us. And, you know, I think we're, we're one of the first to markets in our ability to do that. So I do think that will continue. Um, I think what we're going to see though, in, in light of this is there's going to be a thinning of the herd, um, you know, just because fewer people will actually, you know, be doing, you know, in gym training, I think we're going to see more people that fell in love with working out at home and are going to mm-hmm. do it moving forward. So maybe there's a little bit of a, you know, a rise in, in, in-person training at people's houses, um, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I also just think we're probably going to see less demand. So what, what's going to happen is it's probably going to chop off the bottom 30% as we've already seen of businesses that aren't well run. And, you know, trainers that are a little bit more fly by night, they're people that think it's just a summer job and not a career. Um, and, and I think we will see that, um, you know, there's, there's probably a million other ways it could go. I mean, I think in the past I would have spoken to you like the concept of licensure and higher standards for actually getting into the fitness industry. I, I'm not sure that they'll they'll do that after a year like this when you know people were really cripple, crippled by some of the regulations. So the last thing to do is legislate more. But um yeah it, it will be interesting to see where it heads. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree definitely with the in-house like training as well too, you know, especially with all the modality based training stuff. Like you got the tonal thing, you got the Pelotons, yeah. all that stuff. So I definitely see like a market for that. Um, Eric, so I want to switch gears here, man. I want to go a little sure. bit deep on lifestyle mindset because that's what this podcast yeah. is a little bit about too. Um, so the first question I have with this is um, when was the last time you really had to persevere in your life? Oh, I mean, daily. I just be just being honest. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I work in a small business with my wife. And I'm director of player health and performance for, you know, one of the largest, you know, most well-known sports franchises in the world. Um, and I have three kids at home. <laughs> so it's, there's a lot of competing demands. And, um, you know, I, I think there, you know, any, any day can be a struggle. So, um, and I, I don't think you, you, you ever want to minimize that because I know there are a lot of people that are, um, that are dealing with stuff on a daily basis. And they think that everything's like neat and pretty out there when they see like, a picture of me with my kids smiling on social media or something like we struggle just like everybody else. Yeah, like, yeah. We, don't, we don't get nearly as much family time as I would like. I, you know, I feel like there are days when I'm, I'm not a good mentor to our young coaches. There are days when, you know, I, I put a typo in a program and it irritates me. Like we, we all make mistakes and we all struggle. So I, I, I think, you know, the success is in the struggle and, and I persevere every day. Man, I love that. Yeah, you, you know, and you got to remember, I, I work in a sport where if you fail 70% of the time, you're a hall of famer. Like baseball is a sport that will humble you so quickly. So you, you have to, you know, be willing to kind of just turn that page. Yeah. And I mean, just in general, just you work for like, I mean, you're representing one of the most iconic baseball, you know, uh, organizations in the Yankees. I mean, it's yeah. the Yankees, it's like America's team. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you wear that with, 
you know, the, I think there was a line that said these pinstripes can be very heavy, but you know, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're much more, uh, it's much more of an honor. You know, I get to yeah. Work yeah. With some, some incredible people and, and obviously get some great experiences out of it as well. Absolutely. So Eric, if you had five years to live, what would you stop doing? Wow. Um, I know it's a deep one. You know, that's an interesting one. And I, I, what I, what I would probably I would, what I would props, I would stop avoiding vacations. My mm -hmm. wife and I are notoriously bad about that. Um, you know, we have a, a daughter, our daughter turns two, our third daughter turns two on, on Monday here. And, uh, you, my, my wife, I don't think my wife has actually spent a night away from her. Um, just because everything that we had kind of planned after like that first year where you can start to do stuff got ruined by COVID. So, um, we missed our 10th, you know, wedding anniversary because of COVID. There's just so many things that we weren't able to do in 2020. So I think the first thing I would do is I would make up for a lot of lost time in, in terms of, you know, family time travels, things like that. Okay. Yeah. And where, where would that destination, I was say, where would that destination be? <laughs> um, my gosh. Well, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, we're both from Maine originally. We always savor the opportunity to go back there. So that's probably the first place we go to see family and stuff like gotcha. that. But no, I don't know. We got to, I, I have to stew on that one. That's a good question. We talked about just <laughs> even just driving down to the Keys for a weekend. And even yeah. that seems like a long way to go. Yeah. Right on. Definitely. Um, so what, what's like a kind of like a day in the life of like Eric Cressy, you know, from kind of like morning, like, you know, your morning routine, like your, your midday routine and kind of just like shut it off. I'm just interested in just like habits, like systems, skills that you have like in your, your day to day. Yeah, it definitely fluctuates um, depending on time of year. I'll, I'll give you kind of like a, an off season day. Um, so J January being a, a probably kind of like our craziest time. I'm, um, I'm usually a 5.45 a.m. wake up guy, give or take, um, just because I know that gets me a, a good hour before the girls are up, um, just to get some work done, take care of some emails, uh, make, make the coffee, put the dog out, do stuff like that, just to get my feet underneath me a little bit. Um, so I'll usually get up and, and, and do some work on my own in the quiet house. Um, usually our daughters will get out of bed at 6.45 or 7, um, and you know, from basically 7 to 7.45, it's make their lunches. You know, I usually, my wife usually gets to sleep in a little bit because more often than not, she's been up with our one-year-old all night. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll make lunches, get them squared away for breakfast, you know, get them dressed for school, make sure the backpacks are good to go. I'm usually packing up my own stuff at the same time. Usually my wife is, is up thereafter. So I'm <laughs> in the shower. Then we kind of do a, you know, grab my stuff and go. So I'll drop them off at school um and, and go directly to the facility usually the second i drop them off i've got phone calls in the car on about a 20 minute ride to get there um generally speaking when i roll into the facility there's already athletes there in our first groups so we have an 8 30 start on our first training session but we have a lot of, of kind of like major leaguers who are dads as well and their kids school may be closer to the facility so in, in many cases they'll be in there at like 8 15 rolling out or something and, and honestly i'll coach you know our, our pro crowd uh, pretty much straight through from 8.30 to about 2, give or take, um, depending on time of year. A lot of times there's baseball activities and it might push things back. Um, generally speaking for me, like 2 to 3 is like a catch up on stuff um, where, you know, you usually, you know, have some administrative stuff on the facility side of things. You've got to square away some fires you got to put out. Maybe it's a meeting with a staff member, connect with a physical therapist about some of our rehab guys, whatever it may be. And, you know, usually around 2.30 or 3, I'll, I'll train myself um on, on most days so i can get out of there um you try to get home you know almost always by 4 30 4 45 so that i get you know an hour hour and 20 with the, with the girls before we have dinner um we'll, we'll do dinner and usually get to like play like a game whether it's jenga or sorry or something like that with yeah. the kids. <laughs> we're, we're on a big uno kick with our with our six-year-old twins um we'll do uh do bath and bedtime stories with them um so usually the last door is shut on our kids around Eight and, and to be honest, my wife and I will usually put in a good three hours of work there after, you know, yeah. between she has an optometry practice that she still manages um, up in Massachusetts. And she's also our business director at the gym. And I always have programs. Maybe it's a podcast recording. Maybe it's, um, you know, writing. Maybe it's doing programs for, you know, Yankee stuff. They might be doing medical reviews on free agents. Um, and, you know, invariably every, every car ride is a phone call. There's always someone to reach out to. So, um, you know, agents that have a question or something like that, but it, it goes in hills and valleys. There are times a year when the gym is quieter. So I do a lot more, um, long-term project stuff. And then there are times when, you know, basically we, we, you know, ideally get a little bit more family time and stuff. So, um, but it is, it, it's a very cyclical world. So we're, yeah. we're used to it. 
And what time do you usually just like go to bed? 11? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm usually a little bit before that, I would say. I'm, I'm probably more like a 1030 guy. Um, okay, so cool. 10, 10, 1030 to 545 is probably what I get. I'm, I'm not the best sleeper in the world, but I, <laughs> I at least aim to have my head near a pillow for, for about eight hours, even if it's not fully asleep. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so during your training, are you still hitting those 500 pound deadlifts? Yeah, I, I, embarrassingly, I'm not hitting much of anything right now because I'm actually six weeks post-op on a, on a meniscus repair. I saw that in your uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, I was actually joking. I, um, I, I did an RDL with 165 the other day. The only problem is it was 165 pounds and not kilograms. Mm. So um, <laughs> I, let's just say I'm working my way back and I'm, I'm being very smart. I, I did my follow-up with our team doctor um, at the, the you know, it was like the four week and change mark. And, you know, he reminded me like, hey, everybody feels good right now like the, the mistakes are always made between six and 12 weeks. So I'm, I'm being a very good patient and it's actually been an amazing lesson for me to, to go through this because it's my first orthopedic surgery. But yeah, I, I believe it or not, I tweaked my knee, uh, re-racking a weight on Christmas Eve as I was getting ready to leave the facility. So Jeez. yeah, here I am. <laughs> yeah. 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 Eric, Eric tore a, a tendon in his, uh, or like in his ankle. From, oh no, no. I, I tore the whole cartilage, the whole cartilage and like yeah. almost my Achilles just playing basketball. So when, when, when that happened to Tony, uh, I, I, I kind of felt this pain but i was like oh it's just not I, would, I was actually there when it happened to tony oh, he, 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 when the things were bad up north he came down to hang out in, in mass because his wife's uh, family lives down here and he came by on a saturday afternoon to train at the facility and i was like i was like talking to a client or something like that he came in he, he was warmed up and ready to roll and he did like a jump back start and all, i just remember seeing like a foam roll foam roller going flying and he like uh, he just took a digger and i actually started busting his chops about it i was like what the hell did you do over there and <laughs> He, he didn't really get up. So to his credit though, he actually powered through it, did like a whole upper body workout, even though he had no plantar flexion and the writing was kind of on the wall. And I actually texted one of my ortho buddies to, to get him in on a Sunday morning and check him out. And yeah, sure enough, yeah. the, the, the writing was on the wall for another, uh, for a surgery, unfortunately. Yeah. Wow, right on. So what, what's, what's next for a uh, Cressy sports performance. And then I, I want to know too, like, what is like, what's it going to take for you to reach like your full potential of growth? And, and I'm a big believer in that you have to, you have to grow there before you yep. go there. So what is, what's it going to take for you to get there? And, and even, and just, you know, take your business there. Yeah. I think, um, you know, speaking in the context of Cressy sports performance, um, you know, I, I feel like you walk into our Massachusetts facility. It's a very well-oiled machine. It's a very established business. It's 14 years old. You know, Pete's been there from day one. We have, we have John O'Neill who's a phenomenal director of performance really takes the lead when I'm gone. Um, you know, Florida is a newer business, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, you know, it's not a knock on it. It's just different, right? You're feeling filling out your culture still. And we moved into a new business and we expanded, you know, exponentially added all these different revenue centers and, and new staff members and all that stuff. So to some degree, we're, we're still establishing systems. It's kind of like bailing water out of the boat as it's, as it's sinking. I don't, I don't mean that like in a, in a negative connotation, but you're, you're, you're effectively, you know, it's trial by far because fire be because we, we expanded our business and we added a pandemic on top of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and we, so we just dealt with, you know, absurd headcounts that we never would have seen it, you know, at certain points during this year, we were seeing 190 plus athletes a day spread out over a longer day. And a lot of them weren't just training. They were doing hitting, pitching, you know, maybe they were doing physical therapy with our PT. Maybe they're doing massage therapy or, or LMT. So the, the name of the game in Florida is, is, is really refine those systems. And, and in turn, improve quality of life, right? Because if the systems yeah. are bad. The owners are always cleaning up the mess. That's just the way that it works. So, you know, really that, that's my goal. It kind of leads into your second part of the question. What's, you know, what's, what do you, what do you need to realize your potential? I, I need to be able to do what I'm doing now, but I need to do it with better family dynamics with more, you know, satisfaction on my abilities to, you know, have quality time with my wife and my kids. And, and I, I do feel like we can do that. Um, it's really just a matter of, you know, making sure that we have the right people in the room, which I think we do and, and, you know, getting them all, you know, contributing to developing the systems and, and working on them together. Yeah, absolutely. Right so Eric, before I ask the last question, I mean, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for your time yeah. again. I mean, I got a lot out of this. I'm sure the listeners are going to get a ton out of this. Um, and just um, your humility and just uh, being humble and just being honest, you know, like how you, it's a day to day type of grind too. you have the normal struggles like everybody else does. So thank you so much. And the impact you're making in the, in the fitness industry, you know, like I know we've never met before, but you made a big impact on us when we were doing personal training for like two or three years and then even our online coaching and all that stuff, man. So thank you so much. No, no worries at all, guys. Thank you very much yeah, for having I, me. I echo that too. Yeah. So the, the last question is, what does it mean to Eric Cressy to live a dynamic lifestyle? Oh my gosh. It's, uh, you know, I think that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think for me, it's probably a, a moving target. 
You know, I think uh, if you'd asked me, you know, 10 years ago, it's been able to deadlift 600 and <laughs> play, play pickup hoops and all that stuff. And, you know, I think for me, it's much more about, you know, leaving the industry and the world better than I found it. Um, that means being a good dad, being a good coach, mentoring young staff members and, and, and being versatile in, the, in my ability to, you know, kind of Im improve outcomes for, for everybody I come in contact with, whether that's, you know, at CSP, whether it's, you know, in my kid's life, whether it's working with the Yankees, whatever it may be. So, um, you know, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a good goal for any of us. Yeah, absolutely. Eric, I would say if you had a microphone, pour some water on that microphone. It's on fire. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, Eric, where, where can the listeners uh, connect with you? And then is there anything in particular that we can support you on? Uh, no worries, man. I, I, it's ericcressy.com. There's a free newsletter and podcast and blog. Um, and then uh, on social media, Instagram, uh, Twitter, it's at Eric Cressy. So pretty easy guy to find and always happy to help if I can. Right on. Like I said in the beginning, it's the best name in the world. So guys, <laughs> uh, make sure you guys go follow Eric and see all the cool stuff he's doing. So once again, Eric, thank you so much for your time and um, just cheers to continued success. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, all Eric. right, guys. Until next time. Hey, thanks so much for watching that interview with Eric Cressy. Pretty awesome how he's built that empire of uh, Cressy sports performance and just like how much work he's put in and just, you know, it hasn't all been sexy work. It's just been some of the boring work, but it's just, man, reps and sets and the sacrifice to kind of just build this whole entire empire that he's built. So super, super uh, inspiring, in my opinion. Hopefully you liked it. Comment below what you felt was the most inspiring uh, takeaway from this. The next thing I want you to do is I want you to watch this video right here. And that is basically two crucial mistakes that fitness professionals are making to really kind of move the needle forward in their business. Two crucial mistakes. Trust me, I've seen this before. I've made these mistakes. I'm trying to save you some time and money and pulling out your hair. So make sure to watch that video. Other than that though, thank you so much and we'll see you next time.